welcome. This is the latest iteration of HLA's uh, Speaking of Health Law podcast, and I'm Bill Horton. I'm pleased to be able to host this one uh, along with a great panel of speakers. Uh, we're going to look sort of at the, the year in review or parts of it in the regulatory environment as we reach uh, the end of our second year of the public health emergency. Uh, and this is this is really a carryover from something we did last year, as I hope everyone listening knows. HLA publishes and has published for a couple of decades now uh, HLA's Federal Healthcare Laws and Regulations, which is a compendium of pretty much all the federal healthcare laws and regulations in an increasingly large number of volumes that comes out every year and is a, a great resource. And so what we did last year was ask some of our board of editors for the laws and regs book to spend a little time with us to talk about developments in the regulatory field and in the industry in general. And um, um, just uh, take a little bit of a look back at what's happened and maybe a little bit of a look forward as to what we can expect in 2022. Uh, so as I said, I'm Bill Horton. I'm uh, head of the healthcare industry team, co-head of the healthcare industry team at the Jones Walker Law Firm, working out of its Birmingham office. And we have two great panelists with us today. On the West Coast, we have Judy Waltz. Judy is well known to most of us as uh, uh, the co-leader of the healthcare industry team at Foley and Lardner, and as, as one of the true national gurus on all manner of regulatory issues, reimbursement, enforcement and all kinds of technical stuff uh, that makes for a great resource um, and, and has just finished a term as chair of HLA's uh, regulation accreditation and payment uh, practice group, meaning that uh, for the first time on this podcast, we actually have a wrapper. Uh, so we're excited to have that. And then we also from from right down the street from me, have Dan Murphy, who is a partner in the Birmingham office of Bradley A. Rant Bolt Cummings uh, and is an outstanding uh, healthcare transactional lawyer uh, with also a great focus on regulatory compliance, responding to investigations, all of the things that you have to do if you're gonna be a transactional lawyer in the healthcare field. Um, these are really two, two stars in our area and we're just excited to have the chance to chat with them today. And what I guess I would do uh, to kick us off is really to throw out for the, the two of you uh, kind of your thoughts on where we are from a big picture regulatory standpoint. We've obviously gone through uh, last year a flurry of emergency rules uh, put in place to deal with the COVID pandemic. Uh, we had right at the end of the year, uh, uh, new Stark and any kickback safe harbor rules. We've had a price transparency rule go into effect. We got the No Surprises Act. Um, all manner of developments uh, going on under the continuing sort of umbrella of the, the public health emergency and what has become kind of the, the regulatory version of long COVID. Uh, so uh, kind of from a, from a big picture perspective, I would share with us just some thoughts on kind of where we are in the industry and, and what, you know, what trends we're seeing, what fallout we're seeing from the really unprecedented uh, last year and a half on the, from the regulatory front. Judy, you want to start us off? Yeah, I'll start. So the, the two years since the um, pandemic was declared, the public health emergency was declared, have been pretty crazy times, but also pretty fascinating times from my perspective, um, from a regulatory approach. I started my career as an assistant regional counsel with the Department for Health and Human Services, and my primary client was CMS. And I'm to see CMS move as quickly as they did and as expansively as they did has been pretty darn impressive in my view. But it's been hard for the rest of us to keep up a bit. And, and anything, I mean, I've sort of felt this way since the ACA, but anything I ever knew, I, I want to double check now because I'm not sure that what I have known or what I've known several times is still um, the same thing. So from a big picture perspective, I think it's required 
our clients to, um, to pay a lot more attention to what the regulatory rules are. I've also seen some, um, some issues, and I think we're going to see these going forward with um, uh, um, people assuming they're going to get some breaks because of the PHE if they missed it a little bit. There was just an indictment that I saw that came out with somebody who, who rather broadly interpreted some of the PHE um, waivers and, and is now in big trouble, whether merited or not. So I think it's been a very fluid time, but also a very exciting time. And it's, I, I think the next step will be, first of all, enforcement on some of those, some of the problems that are going to shake out from those regulatory reforms. Um, but secondly, trying to figure out what will become permanent and what will, um, what will go back to the way it used to be. Thanks, Judy. Dan, you want to add to that? Yeah, yeah. Um, I think, you know, compared to last year when we all got together for this podcast, maybe there's a little bit less new rulemaking and regulations that we have to digest. Um, but it was a very busy year for our clients trying to um, operationalize and understand all the stuff that came out last year combined with the public health emergency. Um, you know, I think we'll talk about it a little bit later, but um, for our hospital clients in particular, figuring out how to implement price transparency um, right now, kind of staring down the deadline for surprise billing rules. Um, you know, all, <clears throat> all healthcare providers who are uh, subject to Stark, the Stark group practice change that's coming up uh, in a couple weeks. Um, you know, a lot to digest this year. I, I also think that, um, when we got together last year, we were hoping and maybe expecting that in 2021, we would be unwinding or undoing some of the temporary emergency business arrangements or other arrangements we did um, under waiver protection. And, you know, largely, um, you know, unfortunately, we're still in this long COVID situation. Um, I, I will say, at least from a kind of a practical perspective, we don't have, um, we haven't seen clients really entering into new kind of programs or arrangements relying on those exceptions at this point um, because nobody really knows when it'll be over. Um, you know, they've enjoyed the protection that's lasted up until now, but I don't, I don't see the flurry that we saw, you know, a year before in putting things together in reliance on those waivers. And I think just, just picking up on that thought, one of the things that has been interesting to me is seeing kind of the, uh, to some degree, unintended consequences, but really just the uncertainty that has been attendant upon uh, providers trying to respond to these changes, respond to the emergency rules. I mean, we had a circumstance recently where a client was an ambulatory surgery center that had taken advantage of the, the uh, temporary opportunity to become a temporary hospital uh, under the emergency rules that came out last spring. And then they were very surprised to be notified during the summer that they were having their Medicare billing privileges terminated because they hadn't filed a cost report. Well, they had no idea what a cost report was. I mean, they were an ambulatory surgery center and you know, having seized this opportunity to become a hospital temporarily, they didn't really realize that they had to like learn how hospitals worked under Medicare and what they had to do. And uh, they had to scramble around and, and fix that. And, you know, similarly, I think this is a, as we've talked with some of our physician practice clients about Dan, what you were alluding to the, the group practice changes from last year. I mean, I, what I've seen in more than one case where that smoked out a client that was in fact <laughs> using a system that may not have been quite precisely what it should have been even before the new rule. Right. Um, so there's been catching up on that. And it's really been, uh, um, uh, Judy, I think you said it best. There, there's, I think probably never been a time when it's more important to actually, you know, pull the rules, 
pull the advisory opinions, put this, pull the statute, have them out in front of you because they may not be what you remember. Yeah. Yeah. And I would just say, I've been doing a ton of um, lab work during COVID. I did a lot of work with labs beforehand, but the, the astronomical numbers of, of new labs is just amazing. I was just looking at the CMS um, stats this morning. They're now up to over 300,000 labs across the country. And somewhere I have their, the numbers of their enforcement actions too for entities that they've gone after during, during the last, uh, well, during the PHE, they either didn't know they needed a lab certificate or was, um, were doing testing that uh, was outside the level of certificate that they had. It, the, it, there's just a, an incredible increase in that business. And a lot of, at least the ones that I've been dealing with, a lot of entities that um, have no healthcare background whatsoever. Um, and so this is just a, you know, sometimes a rather, <laughs> rather shocking awakening to them as to, to all the all the nooks and crannies that it that that are required to to be compliant. Yeah, yeah, the lab business has certainly. I mean, there are a lot of people who've gotten in the lab business in the last eighteen months. Uh, some with a lot of background and some with no background at all. And I know personally that I found one of the most difficult things to do was figure out sort of who was authorized to administer it. COVID testing, because mm -hmm. you would think there would be sort of a set of rules there. And in fact, uh, well, maybe there was, and I just wasn't smart enough to find it, but I found myself prowling through lots of stuff, trying to have confidence in the advice I was giving my client about whether they could do what they wanted to do. Well, that would be one suggestion I would have for CMS. And I think I've actually made this to them directly, but if not, they'll, they'll hear it here. Um, if they could include on their website with their clear resources a, a list of not just the state contact people, but a list of some of those basic uh, lab requirements, like if you need an extra state certificate or, or license or who can order what and, and things of that sort would be very helpful. And, and Dan, one of the things uh, I think we've seen that, that maybe you can talk about a little bit is the impact that all these changes have had on uh, transactional and m a activity as as new business opportunities develop people have gotten into new lines and then we've also had you know providers that were very hard hit by the pandemic you know looking to partner uh or sell in order to survive so if you give us a little perspective on what you're seeing as a as a healthcare deal lawyer i think that would be very interesting yeah, it's interesting. I'm interesting. You mentioned um, the labs. We've seen a lot of laboratory startups. Also, anything related to telehealth has been, um, you know, big in startups. And I think, like both of you also said, well, my observation is a lot of those folks are not people experienced with um, healthcare uh, operations or regulations, but they are good business people or have, you know, money to invest. And it's, um, I'll be very interested to see what kind of enforcement problems there are for a lot of these new market entrants uh, coming down the road, because, you know, a lot of them um, just don't have the background that a lot of, you know, established providers would have when they're setting up these um, entities. But um, in terms of deal activity, I don't, I mean, I think everybody uh, everywhere in the country has experienced more deal activity um, I can't, you know, uh, can't ever remember a time as busy as this. Um, and one, one thing that I've, I've thought is interesting that I've observed is that there seems to be so much deal activity that the, um, the leverage has shifted a lot to sellers. And I've seen it, I've seen it affect the diligence process in a way that I haven't seen in, in so far as the sellers are able, I've noticed, to you know, sort of get away with a little bit less um, intrusive uh, diligence from their of their business, and a lot of the deal protections that a buyer, at least in my experience, could customarily insist on, they've not they have not been able to get because 
uh, there are so many, um, you know, because it's such a seller's market. Yeah, and this is, and, and, and one of the things I think that this has pointed up is you've had a lot of money coming into the industry. You've had a lot of private equity investors and, and you've had a lot of money coming in from sources that, that don't have a background in the industry and, and do not always recognize the, the interplay between federal and state law and federal and state regulation and the, you know, the fact that Medicare tells you it will pay, pay for something doesn't mean you can actually do that under state law or the fact that you could do something under state law doesn't necessarily mean you can get paid for doing it. And, and it's, it's, it is a circumstance where what's possible in one state may be impossible or at least very difficult, you know, across the border in the next state. And I think a lot of, uh, a lot of investors who perhaps did not have a full appreciation for that or, uh, you know, getting a quick and sometimes harsh education. Yeah. And, and it's, and that's, that's, that's a good point, Bill. And it's, it's a real challenge, I think, for, you know, advising a new, a new startup type client that if they're not used to hearing that, yes, you, so you have good news, you have a green light at the federal level, but there may be 25 red lights or yellow lights once you try to roll this out across the country. And, you know, that's a challenge if they've never faced that kind of regulatory structure. Um, and especially in this environment where a lot of them are really trying to move fast because they want to move fast generally, but also because they might be trying to set, set up something specific to COVID and there's not time to do, you know, a 50 state survey of every possible issue. So it's, that's also a real challenge. Let's talk, there are a, a couple of you know, major changes that are really not COVID or pandemic driven, but that, that have potentially profound effects and, and are not all that easy to work with. And about the, the, the price transparency rule that went into effect uh, at the beginning of this year. And I think a lot of, a lot of hospitals uh, particularly, you know, smaller and independent hospitals sort of sat back thinking this really isn't going to happen. The can is going to get kicked down the road some more, and we're not going to have to be ready to produce all this information on January 1st. And then they did. And that compliance has been kind of all over the map and, and sort of on a, you know, related topic is the no surprises act and, uh, to some extent, state law surprise billing rules that really are uh, potentially upending a lot of economic arrangements within the industry that that have been in place for a long time. Um, yeah, maybe if if you all could share some thoughts on on those developments and what you're seeing with your clients as the challenges they're facing and how they're coping with them. Uh, I'll, I'll jump in on that first. So I'm not a big fan of price transparency for hospitals. I mean, I know it doesn't matter. My personal opinion doesn't matter that much, but uh, it, you know what hospitals charge <laughs> has very little to do at the end of the day with what they get paid. And, and it, there's just so many, so many different complications that go into, you know, it's not, it's not like you say, okay, this is what we charge and, you, you know, this is what every, it, it just, it, it, it's too, um, uh, so anyway, I, I'm not a big fan of that, but we're going forward with it, obviously, and, and I know it's a big burden, and, and I guess my, my point is, I'm not sure at the end of the day, the data is going to be that helpful to us going forward. What I would know, you know, and not, not to keep focusing on labs, but the lab transparency regs uh, with pricing for COVID testing are kind of an interesting angle on that. They're in the same part as the, the same section with the transparency regs. And there the, you know, a, a, a lab that offers COVID tests has to post online its usual cost, you know, like 100, let's say 120 bucks for a test. And then with respect to um, insurers, they either have to negotiate a rate with that lab, like they'll pay 100 bucks, not 120, or they pay the 
the listed price, um, which many of my clients have, have um, make quite a profit on them. You list a high price and then everybody has to pay it unless they enter into it. So, so there it actually has some relationship to, to what's being done. But I, I do think that a lot of the hospital information, it, it does, it, it will impact not necessarily or not to a significant extent, in my view, the Medicare um, reimbursements, but it will, it will impact potentially the commercial um, relationships. And I think the same thing on the No Surprises um, Act. I mean, I, I see a real need for that. That was, it was a hardship for a lot of people. But at the end of the day, I do think the consequences may, may not be what was intended. Uh, and so with that, I'm going to send, send it over to Dan for, for his comments. Yeah, well, I, I will, first thing I'll pick up on is I agree, I think for both rules, the consequences I would suspect are not going to be what the lawmakers intended, um, policymakers intended, uh, especially I think on the price transparency. So kind of from a operational perspective, when I've been talking to my clients about this, you know, it's not, it's not just that it's kind of a pain administratively, and it is to set up, um, you know, the, the, the tools to disclose pricing on, in compliance with the rule. That, that's difficult, especially in the middle of a pandemic. But I think the frustrating thing from our clients is just that, you know, they set this up, but they don't think anybody's going to use it, or not that many people are going to use the tool certainly not your average customer uh, who's going to go and look at the machine readable file. Um, maybe, maybe the, maybe the, um, you know, the shoppable product file that's a little more user-friendly, some people will look at, but in terms of actually, you know, on a mass scale, if it's going to really change consumer beha patient behavior, you know, it's hard to see that now. And I think that's kind of frustrating when they go to all that effort to, to set up the tools. Um, on the surprise billing rules, you know, that's, that's another one where right now that one, it seems to be from, again, from kind of the operational perspective, e even more difficult or a lot more difficult for, for a hospital to operationalize. And we're talking to our clients about this right now. Um, and it's not because it's not just that you have to put up a website or post a file. Um, you have to depend on, if you're a hospital, say, you've got to depend on information coming into you that's complete and accurate from other providers, doctors, or from payers. So you have to coordinate a bunch of information. You have to change your work processes and disclosures to patients. Um, you know, I know that um, I think the AMA and the Hospital Association filed a lawsuit to enjoin part of the surprise billing rules just the part dealing with the dispute resolution process. Um, but I, you know, I, I, I haven't heard anything about most of the rules being delayed. And I just, you know, I kind of, my, my, my suspicion is they may end up just in a spot where they are with transparency, which is okay, we didn't delay it further, but compliance is abysmal. So, you know, I, uh, I always think one of the great you know, sort of parables of the healthcare industry is, is something that I saw in 1995. I was at the annual meeting of what was then the National Health Lawyers Association, ultimately became HLA. And one of the speakers was somebody who had been a legislative aide to Congressman Stark uh, in when the Stark Law was being put together. And I swear this is as close to a direct quote as I can make it. In her presentation, she said, you know, the next time we pass a law like this, we're going to talk to some people who understand how Medicare reimbursement works before we finalize the bill. And so much of what we're seeing now, I think, comes from the fact that we have this really complicated, convoluted system, and we have uh, folks in the administration, folks in Congress who don't understand how hard it is, who don't understand that, as Judy, as you were saying, that 
you know, a hospital's charge master is not an inherently meaningful document. Uh, you have folks who don't understand that talking about, you know, uh, the the median price that a payer pays for something, or the you know the 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 typical managed care payment you get for a particular service. Again, that's not that's not meaningful information because that's not that's not a single number. That's not something that that is sort of independently derivable in a meaningful way. But yet we have laws being passed and rules being adopted that we have to try to sort out how to comply with even where the information is not necessarily the right information or the most helpful information. Um, but that seems to be where we're going to live with it. And, and Judy, maybe this is a good uh, sort of point of Andre into something you were mentioning as we were talking about this, talking about uh, um, sort of the potential for rulemaking reform and, and the role of sub-regulatory guidance in uh, regulating the industry and advising our, our clients. Yeah, thanks, Bill. To me, this is a real sleeper issue that, that has the potential to dramatically change how things um, go forward, both in the Medicare um, reimbursement side and also in the enforcement side. So um, this started under the Trump administration with a desire to get away from the reliance on sub-regulatory guidance. So sub-regulatory guidance is like the CMS manuals and the, all the millions of things they put out as, as guidance um, that were then being used for um, enforcement actions of, of one sort and another. So both DOJ and um, under the Trump administration, HHS, indicated that they wanted to back off of um, reliance that they wouldn't base False Claims Act cases solely on, on um, a lack of compliance with sub-regulatory guidance. And then there, um, there were also some Supreme Court decisions, Alina, um, along the same lines, that um, were underscoring the need for rulemaking process so that people had a chance to weigh in on things um, um, before they became final. And I'll just give one example of a, a matter that I worked on um, it, that involved teaching physicians in their supervision of, of um, residents and how many concurrent or overlapping, and that, that's a big deal in terms of terminology, the difference between concurrent and overlapping, um, how many um, how many such procedures one teaching physician could um, could oversee. So the actual prohibition there is in the sub-regulatory guidance in the manual. There's some, some regulations that, that were used to get to that position. But um, in a case I handled, we argued to DOJ that that was sub-regulatory guidance and we cited all of the, the materials that had come out under the Trump administration saying, you know, that they should drop our case, but we didn't get anywhere with that argument. It was, it, the answer was kind of like, that's our decision to make, not your decision to make. And so anyway, um, so much for that. So I don't know how, how much that actually impacted the decisions, but since the Trump administration um, changed to the Biden administration, the both DOJ and HHS have backed off on that. DOJ um, issued a a memo in July saying that, that they were abandoning the, the earlier positions. Um, HHS has, um, has taken back some of the regulations that were passed by the Trump administration and some of them have been deferred. There's one up now, um, uh, another one that, uh, that was on a different angle but also had the impact or the potential for impact was that as regulations aged out, if they had not been reviewed within a certain period of time, I think it was 10 years, that they'd just die of their own age, which to me was just a very, um, very chaotic approach to, to um, looking at regulations. If you think about conditions of participation that 
bits and pieces have been added at different you know points as people recognized a problem so yeah so and from my perspective it needed a more holistic approach so anyway that is that um I'll call it the get rid of clutter <laughs> proposal on the age one. Um, there is currently uh, a proposed, um, uh, well, a request for comment on the approach that should be taken there. Um, someone just sent me a 30 page comment that they'd submitted on, on all of that, nicely footnoted. And, and I admit I haven't read it through. And, but anyway, the, the idea is that we have so much regulation as it is. We have so much sub-regulatory guidance and uh, that it's very hard for providers and suppliers to, to comply. And this would, the Trump administration approach would have reduced their risk of non-compliance. Um, but the Biden administration is getting back to the expectation of, of you know, pretty substantial compliance. I mean, and I think again, in in sort of the continuing lesson that um, nothing is easy in this regard. I think it is certainly a reasonable position to say that we've got regulations on the books that do not serve any purpose anymore, and and it is I think very defensible to say, well, there's conflicting guidance out there, and there is guidance that is inconsistent um, with other guidance, and guidance that's inconsistent with letter of the regulations, but at the same time, the, the, the Trump administration proposal that, that you mentioned that would have essentially created an automatic sunset for rules uh, just based on how old they were unless they had been reviewed and sort of you know reaffirmed, you could conceive of a situation where the anti-kickback statute, because it's a statute, would still be on the books, but all of a sudden all the safe harbors would be gone because yeah. they had kind of you know reached their maturity. The same thing with the exceptions in the Stark regulations, the conditions of participation, as you said. This is it, it is very tempting to think there is some sort of a magic wand we can wave and and make the industry less complicated uh, for folks to rely on, but we, we have built such a complex and in some respects irrational structure that you, you kind of just can't go around pulling bricks out of the wall without uh, you know, running the risk that half the house is gonna fall down. Um, Dan, you had mentioned before, and we talked briefly about the uh, the changes in the Stark rules on, on the group practice definition and compensation systems, and that uh, you know was announced this time last year. What are you seeing in terms of how people have been responding uh, to that? Yeah, <clears throat> well, Bill, Bill, I think you had a good description of um, the effect of this. This group practice uh, definition and pro um, special rules on um, productivity bonuses and profit shares, those changes that are coming into effect um, beginning of 2022, I've also seen an effect, like you said, of smoking out some other issues. So, you know, um, our, you know the more, more proactive uh, practices and other, you know, health systems out there who've been looking at this all year long, um, who started early, started digging into their models from what we saw. And, um, you know, not only, not only might it be some, one, one of the new changes that they have to tweak to comply with the rules in 2022, like not doing split pooling anymore, but, you know, there may have been a model that they put in place a long time ago, and it was great at the time. And as you look at it again, may have drifted out of compliance. Um, so we've seen a lot of that. We're seeing, you know, we're, we're seeing um, some of the, you know, lesser, I guess, less proactive um, groups just now dawning on them that in two weeks or a couple of weeks ago, a month, um, this was going to have to change, um, which is a scramble. But the, the other thing, the, the other thing that if there is a silver lining to sort of this 
smoking out of issues that may not have been identified before um, and a scramble to change before 1-1. One, one. one of the silver linings has been that when we have dug in and we've been seeing these issues, you know, lo and behold, all these changes that CMS has made and clarifications to policies on more technical issues have been really helpful to kind of remedy or, you know, either remedy or help us conclude there hasn't been a problem. Whereas if we were going through this exercise a couple of years ago, there might've been some more disclosures warranted. Yeah, that's, uh, and that has been fascinating to watch. And we've seen, I know uh, I saw a circumstance recently where um, a hospital had submitted uh, a start self-referral self-disclosure um, submission year, literally years ago um, that CMS it's finally kind of hit the top of the stack and since then the CMS has put out additional guidance and and the CMS reviewer sort of contacted the hospital or the people who are now own the hospital and said do you want to look at this again and see if you want to withdraw any of this disclosure in light of things we have said since then? And, and it was very apparent that they were really trying to avoid, um, you know, an unnecessarily, you know, punitive and expensive process for something that, you know, just didn't, it wasn't worth fooling with at this stage because of how things have matured. And I, and I guess one other thing on that point, when we talk about briefly, we're getting close to the end of our time, but uh, we've seen this recent pronouncement on a, a, a liberalization, if you will, of, of the historic policies on co-location, which have you know, required some really um, um, one might characterize them as sort of picayune arrangements to be put in place to ensure that that you satisfy the the very rigid co-location requirements and that you you know didn't have uh, something that looked like it was a hospital within hospital but you know fell out on some technical uh, frankly immaterial issue and and so Perhaps this is a little encouraging uh, that we're seeing uh, some effort to to adjust the rules to the way healthcare is being delivered now, and to delivery models that make you know more sense from an economic perspective. Any any thoughts on that? Um, I do think that the co-location rules um, historically had been interpreted so. Um, so strictly, um, although I haven't seen these come up in surveys, but it, I know when people were asking CMS for advice up front, there were even some restrictions about shared um, lobby space, you know, entry space, and and just things that you know made, from my sense or from my from my perspective, didn't make any sense in the provision of care. And so basically, what the co-location guidance says is you can have two entities sharing space, but if something goes wrong, they're both um, going to be <laughs> at risk or whatever it is that went wrong. You know, they aren't going to be able to say, oh, but that was their corner of the room or that was their person. Um, and to me, that's an eminently fair. If you're going to share space, then you share the baggage that comes with it. Um, I'm hoping that they'll extend that also to um, biops. Right now, there's a a survey and cert memo out there that says that labs have to, you can have two labs, two CLIA certificates, two labs in the same space, but they have to be, um, at least this has been my interpretation, I'm revisiting that now, they have to be separated either by time or space in terms of their operations. Again, that doesn't, you know, if you draw a line down the floor, you, it, it doesn't make a lot of sense if everybody's willing to just take, take accountability for what happens in that space. So I do think those are both, um, and in particular the co-location guidance for hospitals is a situation where CMS said, is this really important to us? And then did the right thing and, and backed off from some, some rules that just didn't fit anymore. 
Yeah, and I one one other thing, I was glad to see the revised guidance on co-location, um, and it it occurred to me, I don't know how much um, HHS thought about things like co-location or providers where there's a rigid, you know, exclusive use requirement like ASCs or IDTFs when they were doing all the regulatory sprint stuff, but it, you know, it occurs to me as we've been trying to put together value-based enterprises that one barrier to coordinating care is if you physically can't send another provider into another space that's, you know, helpful for coordinating a patient's care. And it seems like, you know, especially for hospital co-location, that will make things a little easier to coordinate with other providers. Yeah, and that that is, I mean, I think if you're looking for something encouraging, as both of you have said, this idea that CMS is really sort of re-examining some longstanding policies to look at, okay, well, does this, does this really make any sense? Is this actually an impediment to the efficient provision of care? Um, and, and making changes, or at least talking about making changes where they find that to be the case. I mean, that's... Um, that's a refreshing thing. Honestly, it hasn't always been what we've seen and certainly uh, would love to see more of that uh, as, as one of the things the pandemic has done is really give us an opportunity to, I think, test some ideas about how care could be delivered better, not only by telemedicine, but just in, in other, you know, coordinated arrangements that have been conducted under the various, you know, waivers and emergency rules. And I think it's a great opportunity to use that and hopefully have meaningful regulatory reform that will uh, enable us to, to you know, bring care and reimbursement, you know, as a legal matter, more to where we are already capable of doing it as a, you know, as an operational matter. Uh, we are, we are, I think about at the end of our scheduled time, but you can't do a year in review uh, without at least making a prediction or two. So what's the most important thing? Uh, and we've really been talking here largely about provider clients. So I guess we'll stick with that, but what's the most important thing that healthcare providers should be looking out for in 2022, aside from the five eighty cap Kappa variant of, of COVID? I feel like the last two years have been so unpredictable. I, I am not convinced that COVID is over, but I think the PHE period might be declared over at an earlier point than we expect um, for one reason and another. And when that happens, I think there's going to be a mad scramble to figure out what, what was done under the waivers and how to undo them or if they need to be undone. So I think that's gonna be out there. And then I do think as well that we'll start seeing some enforcement um, for things that are coming out of the pandemic and the additional funding that's gone into um, PHE efforts, maybe specifically HRSA. Um, so just the things that keep me up at night. Yeah. I would I would say enforcement, um, you know, unless unless COVID goes on in a terrible pace for the whole next year, it seems like um, a lot of enforcement activity may be coming specifically related to COVID, but also, um, you know, to the extent that some activities may have been ramped down while providers and others were just struggling to take care of patients for two years. Yeah. And that's, um, yeah, I think both of you are right. And a lot of it is going to be dependent on whether, you know, we succeed in getting to a situation where COVID is perhaps still around, but no longer an emergency, but is something that we've kind of built into, you know, our day-to-day -day life. I hate to talk about it that way, but um, obviously we are looking at adjustments that have been made, some of which I think are gonna to have to stay in place because that's the world we're living in now. But um, but I do expect we'll see some stopping and, and taking stock of what's happened, particularly with so many new entrants into various parts of the healthcare spectrum. Um, I think 
you know, Dan, you talk about enforcement activity. I think we are going to see that because I think we're going to see some of these people who, you know, suddenly became laboratory experts and testing experts and, and um, COVID experts are perhaps going to be uh, called to account for some of the things that they did or didn't do in that process uh, because they really had not prepared to do it. So anyway, I think this has been a great discussion. And I think one thing, uh, if we want one conclusion that no one can argue with, uh, that mm -hmm. I personally think is a good conclusion is that healthcare lawyers are still going to have a lot of stuff to do in 2022. Um, and some of it will be challenging stuff that we haven't done before, which is always fun. Uh, so we're appreciative of HLA for providing this opportunity for us to talk about some of those ideas and concepts and, uh, and we'll look forward to what happens next. Uh, and thank you all for your time.